know what you guys are doing here. I, I you should be getting drunk at holiday parties or like <laughs> at the mall, God forbid, buying no kidding. Christmas gifts. So well, I didn't think anyone was going to show up. So you know, but we are prepared just in case. So uh, thank you for you know taking the time and being willing to come out out here and do this. So. Uh, my name is Kathy Labriola, as you heard. Uh, my name in Italian means big mouth, and it's true. <laughs> and Dawn's a big mouth too, if she doesn't mind me saying so. Uh, but she's got a kind of a boring American name like Davidson. So. No, that's, it's, it's Scottish. <laughs> Scottish. It's not okay. boring at all. But she's a big mouth too. So uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking tonight about something we call jealousy first aid, and our goal is to uh, throw a lot of tools at you, a lot of different ideas, concepts, and uh, techniques uh, about jealousy uh, because we want to give you as many tools as you can have. Uh, everyone's uh, jealousy profile and jealousy experience is very individual and unique, and people are at very different places with their jealousy, so uh, some of the stuff we're going to talk about won't be particularly pertinent to you individually, but I can say there will be some things tonight that hopefully will be useful to you. It's always a little challenging with uh, doing these jealousy workshops because uh, usually in any given audience, about half the people are kind of brand new to the whole idea of open relationships and they're having their first uh, terrifying and intense experience of jealousy and about the other half are like way, way more advanced and so it's a little hard to cover stuff for everybody but bear with us and I'm pretty certain we'll come up with some things that'll be good for, every, uh, that will help each person here. Uh, I want to mention right off the bat we are filming uh, my very good friend and favorite gal pal, J.J. Noir, a documentary filmmaker, is filming this for us. She is filming just Dawn and I and she will not be filming you, the audience, because we want to protect your privacy and confidentiality. Uh, the uh, only uh, potential issue is if you ask a question later or if you want to say something later, uh, then you should let us know if you don't want your voice to be in the video. Even when uh, you're talking out in the audience, we're not gonna be filming you. She'll keep the camera up here to protect your privacy. Uh, but if for any reason you don't want your voice in the video, to either tell us right away or afterward talk to me or Dawn or to JJ directly. Um, I appreciate uh, people being willing to let us film this. Uh, I put a lot of these uh, videos on my website as a free educational tool because uh, here in the Bay Area we're lucky to have a very progressive environment but uh, a lot of people look at my website for information and uh, that don't have uh, any kind of opportunity to go to a class like this because they live in a much more uh, repressive place. <laughs> so um, I, I like to have these tools on, on the, uh, the videos on the website as a free educational tool because uh, I get lots of calls from people saying, I was having a major nuclear meltdown jealousy attack at 2 a.m. Right. and I was just about to get in my car and drive over to my partner's house and try to break the door down because I know he's in there with her having sex right now. And then I saw your video and I thought, oh, I feel calmer now. Maybe that's not such a really good idea after <laughs> all. Maybe I'll just wait till morning. You know? So I appreciate being able to film these uh, classes so I can put them on the website. Uh, and this one will be on there relatively soon. So uh, I want to just tell you what kind of our plan is for the evening. Uh, I think they're going to throw us out of here at 9.30. It's 8 o'clock now. Uh, I'm, first, I'm going to talk just a little bit about jealousy in general and kind of a very basic, a few little basic concepts and ideas. Uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to Dawn, and she's going to be talking about uh, her jealousy diagnostic tool. Uh, then it's going to, back to me, I'm going to be talking about an exercise that I call the jealousy pie chart, which is a way of breaking down and deconstructing the different thoughts, feelings, and experiences you're having during a jealousy attack and trying to figure out what all those feelings are and what the hell can you do about them to feel better now. Uh, then I'm going to hand it back to Dawn. She's going to talk about jealousy, uh, coveting, and envy. And she's going to talk a little bit about uh, compersion. And then uh, I'm going to then she's going to give it back to me. I'm going to talk about some uh, tips for 
how to survive the holidays uh, and avoid polydrama over the holidays. Uh, and then we're gonna open it up to you for, to hear some of your uh, questions as well as uh, we're hoping we'll, you'll tell us your worst case jealousy scenarios and ask advice from us as well as other very smart people in the audience who will have some good ideas for you. So, did I cover it? Well, I sure hope so. Okay, uh, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about jealousy. The tools we're going to give you today are designed to help you to uh, reduce the frequency and intensity of your jealousy experiences and to learn to manage your jealousy better. Uh, I want to point out that this class is not designed to help you eliminate jealousy because uh, yeah, if you're looking for that, you're, that's down the hall here, a different <laughs> class. Uh, personally, in my experience, for most of us, that's really not a realistic goal. Uh, and I'm always in favor of setting a goal that you actually can achieve rather than setting yourself up to fail. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why we have intense experiences of jealousy. And people often will call me up and say, well, I'm just starting out in this poly relationship and I, I'm so shocked that I'm jealous. I never thought I'd be jealous. I'm so surprised. And I always say, well, I'm surprised you're surprised. You know, I'm, I'm shocked you're shocked. I mean, your, your precious beloved is out right now having sex, romance, and maybe love with someone else. You know, why wouldn't you be like in a deranged state of jealousy right now? Wouldn't that seem perfectly normal and natural? But I think because we're poly people, we have this expectation of ourselves that we shouldn't be jealous or we won't be jealous. And uh, I often have people asking me, well, is jealousy just natural? Is it normal or is it learned or is it nature or nurture? And you know, so that's a very complicated question that we're not gonna spend any time on tonight except to say that uh, I, my personal feeling is it's some combination of nature and nurture. Uh, it's no secret that Homo sapiens as a species have a very poor track record in sharing anything, uh, <laughs> land or food or resources, or certainly not have, a, we certainly don't have a good track record in sharing our beloved partners uh, with other people. So uh, we just seem to be a selfish, greedy, very possessive, controlling species. And uh, that just seems to be the, the way it is, and uh, it does seem to take an awful lot to change that. You know, you could say that we, we're that way because, uh, at least here, that we're that way because we were uh, raised in a, an evil capitalist society that teaches us to be greedy and selfish and just look out for number one. Uh, or you could say it's, you know, uh, genetic, you know, that we just, uh, millions of years of evolution have led us to be possessive and jealous because it uh, has had a survival benefit at one time. Uh, if you listen to any of these uh, evolutionary biologists there, we say that uh, you know it, it, it had a survival benefit to be jealous because if you guarded your mate, as they call it, uh, if you guarded your mate successfully, then you would be able to procreate your genes and reproduce your genes and, and your offspring would live and grow to adulthood and all that. So that they believe that we therefore develop this jealousy as part of our just genetic makeup, and that may be true, it may not be, but the reality is that uh, the vast majority of people are have a tendency to be jealous in a lot of situations, and especially in a situation uh, of a romantic relationship where your partner is either interested in someone else or is, is uh, actually involved in a relationship with someone else. And certainly the monogamous people are just as jealous as we are, uh, for a lot, of some, a lot of them, that's why they decided to be monogamous. They think that somehow that will spare them from getting jealous. But I get calls all the time from monogamous people who are insanely jealous of their partner. If the partner just, you know, gets too friendly with somebody at work or, you know, is, you know, joking and laughing with someone at a party or, you know, they have jealousy just Or as just much goes as to do. work and stays there. What's it? Or just goes to work and stays there. And stays late, yeah, or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, who knows what they're up to there. Or the so. football widow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so so uh, jealousy just seems to be part of who we are, and it takes a lot of time and effort to try to change that experience, that reaction. Uh, and 
As I said, we're, our, our goal here tonight is not to help you eliminate your jealousy because there is a second reason why I don't recommend that, and that is that it's not really a good idea. Uh, your jealousy is there for a reason. Uh, your jealousy is a kind of an early warning system that is alerting you to the fact that there is a potential threat to the quality, the stability, or even the survival of your precious relationship. And I emphasize the word potential, potential threat. Doesn't mean it is a threat, but anytime your partner has a sexual or romantic interest in someone else and pursues that interest, that creates a potential threat to your relationship. That outside sexual and romantic interest and the pursuit of that interest could potentially disrupt, destabilize, or destroy your relationship. So you should be paying attention. <laughs> you should be taking a look at that situation and seeing, wow, who is this person and what are they up to and what is my partner up to and what are their motives, what is their actual behavior, what is it they're trying to do here and why are they in this relationship and how does it affect me? <laughs> and it doesn't mean you have to be a psychotic maniac and you know do surveillance on your partner all the time or anything like that. I just mean that your jealousy is alerting you that there's something happening that could potentially be disruptive to your relationship. And so you should be at least paying attention to it and trying to understand what's going on there and figuring out whether that situation is safe for you and for your relationship and if there's anything you need to do about that. So, now that we got that out of the way, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dawn and you can talk a little bit about your what she calls her diagnostic jealousy tool. Is that right? Uh, okay, she's saying now you need to give me oh. the mic. That's what's going on. <laughs> okay. Technical <laughs> difficulties here. Yeah. You just leave it on the table. Just yeah. There we go. Okay. Okay. How are we doing? Is that good? Oh! oh. Woohoo! That was going to happen. Yay! Go ahead and I'll go. Okay. <laughs> well, that's okay. That's uh, sort of uh, feels like how my life has been recently. Oh. Um, uh, some of you may, oh. okay. may or may not know, I just uh, sold my house and moved after 21 years. Uh, and I spent all afternoon trying to find all the pieces to actually print out the uh, various handouts that we were talking about today, and I s did not succeed at any of those. Uh, so instead, I'm going to hand you guys a little uh, uh, a sign-up sheet where you can get this jealousy diagnostic tool uh, of which she speaks. So. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we're, we're the Laurel and Hardy of the polyamory movement up here. So. <laughs> all right. We planned all these stunts out. Right, you know? right. Exactly. <laughs> Just to look like morons, you know, we did it on purpose. Okay. And see how effective it was. Yeah. So um, I do have a few copies of this uh, handout that we're going to be talking about. So I'm going to get one out for me so I can refer to it. Um, and um, basically what I want to start with is I want to talk with you guys about what are the things that trigger your jealousy? Because one of the things that Kathy's going to do in a few minutes is she's going to help you figure out that, uh, you know, how, what your jealousy is comprised of. Uh, she calls it the jealousy pie chart. I like to call it bake a jealousy pie. Um, and uh, to do that, uh, you have to realize mm -hmm. that jealousy, as we understand it, is not a singular emotion. It's a complex of emotions. It's actually usually comprised of a large part of envy combined with fear or anxiety and uh, sometimes there'll be anger or sadness in there as well. So these are the, the overall big picture items that might be in your jealousy. And once you figure out what's in your jealousy, it's easier to deal with it. Because for one thing, you can then figure out 
how there are a lot of things that you're not experiencing. You may not have most of the possible jealousy triggers, or you might. Uh, so, but the more you can get a picture of what it really is, the less unknowns there are and the more you are able to figure out what tools to bring to bear in that particular situation. So, uh, let's talk about, uh, I wanna get the uh, ideas from you. What are, just you know, popcorn out, what are some of the big things that you feel are triggers for your jealousy? Everybody all at once. Don't be yes. shy. <laughs> Right. So when that partner goes on a date, what is it that you're particularly afraid of in that case? Uh, losing them as a, as a partner. Yeah, fear of loss. That's, that's one of the big categories, um, especially losing that particular oh. partnership. Maybe you're fearing, you know, what you've, uh, all the time you've put into it already. Good Lord, what is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> I can I can restate. Okay. Just remind yeah, me to restate. Can't hear it. Yeah. Yes. Um, my partner having sex with another person. Yeah, your partner having sex with another person. That's a big one for oh, yeah. a lot of people yeah. in our culture, especially since we have this uh, idea of couple privilege that there's uh, you know, there is a couple and the couple should be kept uh, sacred to each other. And as a result, we have uh, a lot of idea of that sex is often one of the things that we reserve within a couple, especially you know in a monogamous relationship, of course, that's kind of the definition of it. So um, anything else? Any other big ones that uh, people have discovered are their personal triggers? Yes? Ah, uh, yes, yes. The repeat it. Repeat it. Not them leaving, it's me ending up like the boring home husband. And they have all their fun experiences elsewhere. So he's saying uh, it's, uh, his concern is that he ends up feeling like the boring stay-at-home husband and all the fun is going to someone else. Uh, let's see, I'm not sure what I called that one. Uh, but it's in here, I know it's in here. Uh, uh, being taken, it's under exclusion and marginalization, being taken for granted or relegated to the ordinary while the new partner gets all the goodies. Yeah, so um, that's, uh, that's definitely one. Anybody else? Yes, back there I see somebody. Hi, um, Sumati. Hi, Sumati, I can see you now. Right, uh, feeling not enough. Yeah, that's definitely uh, in here. I've got uh, some uh, competition. You know, whenever you're trying to keep up with somebody in any way or you feel like you're competing with them, which comes out of that, I'm not good enough. I'm not enough for whatever reason. Uh, that's definitely a big one for a lot of people. Feeling like you're losing the time together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, there's a competition for the scarce resource. That's one of the things that uh, uh, Kathy's four-part model, which I love, is, uh, is really clear on. When you feel like you have uh, a competition over something and uh, you feel like you're gonna lose, that's part of the recipe for feeling jealousy. So um, I saw, all right, here, yes. Um, for me, one of the things that I find most str struggling with is loss of attention. And so if the people are not calling families together, I can be really delighted as long as I am experiencing attention also until I feel like that's attention, again, it's loss, we experience loss. Yeah, loss of attention, or uh, sometimes I think I call this uh, loss, of, loss of specialness. You know, that's that 
that thing about uh, getting that time and attention from the other person. Of course, one of the real good things about polyamory, if you're able to uh, manage to do this, which for some people feels like you know juggling or something, is uh, that you can fight that loss of attention by understanding that you have stand to get more attention, actually, if you can view the larger picture and not just your immediate partner, but see that you're now part of a larger network and therefore you could get attention from four people, you know, in the next day. And wouldn't that be great if you were able to really feel the compersion, that feeling of happiness for our partner's happiness, as well as get that uh, attention for yourself. So, yes. Mm-hmm, yep, when your partner is gonna be um, holding something special, right? F but they want to do that with somebody that isn't you. And that, uh, that can be a real challenge. It can be one thing that you can use in reverse that especially if you're just starting out with this or uh, you're just starting a, a new particular relationship, uh, sometimes it can help if you say, well, I want to do, I want to keep that thing special to us for right now. And uh, eventually uh, it's better if you can uh, become a little less, uh, I um, what is it I'm trying to say? Possessive. Uh, and possessive, that's the word. <laughs> Less possessive uh, about those sorts of things. But uh, I do find it's a great interim tool, especially. So, yeah. It's not just a special thing, it's a mundane thing. Uh huh. It suddenly becomes special. Oh, we're going to go grocery shopping. <gasps> that's right. <laughs> it's our pet together. How can you share our pet with her? So sometimes it's the things of <laughs> yes. the parents and the shopping and the dinner and the yeah. special. I don't know about the rest. Can you of just repeat that for, so we can? Yeah. Uh, that uh, what she's saying is that it's um, a real challenge when mundane things get uh, done with somebody else. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody, you're... Your partner says, well, I'm going to go to the grocery store with that person. Or I have suddenly, I, you know, and you suddenly develop this insane desire to go to the pet store, <laughs> you know. Um, and again, that's that, uh, you know, balance between the mundane and the special. And I don't know about you, but in my relationships, I have been on both sides of that at various times. And sometimes what I miss is that dailiness. You know, I have one partner that I don't live with, but he's my most primary partner right now. And what I don't often get is that, you know, running an errand, going to this, the grocery store or whatever, but his partner that lives with him, both of his other partners that live with him, experience the opposite of it. They're often uh, jealous or specifically envious of me because I get the special time. He comes to me and we don't have to run the errands and we don't have to go to the grocery store and we don't have to you know, take each other to the hospital or whatever, we get to have the play. So, which you know, has its pluses and minuses both directions. And I'm guessing that we probably should wrap up this se section fairly soon. Anybody um, else have a pressing, any other an urgent? OK, yeah, let's take those two more. Like like yes. Yes. Somebody else and you don't, or, or they think have, you know, so there's more friends or more something. Yes, he's saying when there's an imbalance in the relationship. So maybe one person has more 
uh, sexual partners. Maybe the other person has more friends. Maybe you know there's some kind of inequality, and that's uh, there in number five, mm -hmm. uh, inequality. Um, and one of the notes I have under that is especially if one partner is uh, an extrovert, an introvert uh, that is in relationship with them might feel left out. Even though they want to be alone, they may still end up feeling left out because that extrovert is wanting to go out and get uh, more attention more often. So uh, there's one more person in the back. One. Yes, you've been raising your hand all all the time. So. Good. Oh. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. So she's saying that uh, her partner says that she's a bull and the other partner is China, and she's like, "But I want to be China too," <laughs> you know. And again, it's that competitiveness. It's that comparison. Uh, I generally find that the comparison in anything is really one of the biggest things that uh, I think our jealousy is here to teach us is how to not compare our insides to somebody else's outsides. And that is a tough thing to learn how to do and jealousy is one of the tools that can do that for you. Uh, it's just a matter of learning how to deal with that jealousy. So uh, I'm, how are we doing on getting the uh, handout delivered out there? Are we, great, okay, so you can get uh, a free copy of this, uh, that I've got uh, 11 different categories and I forget how many, 40 something. Uh, different specific items and I'm always happy to receive new ones if you think there's something that you're experiencing that isn't on there or that your partner experiences that isn't on there feel free to drop me a line anytime I'm always uh, happy to update and improve and um, when you get onto that list to get this uh, free handout that'll also get you on my newsletter list which is short at the moment and as soon as I figure out where all the physical pieces of my life are, then the next uh, thing on my list is getting my electronic life in better order. So there should be more coming soon. <laughs> so, oh, hey, um, good. Are, are you are you we on with you now? What is that? Is that okay? Okay. We're technically challenged here. Okay, uh, one thing I forgot to mention earlier is that uh, we are selling books in the back and I am donating the proceeds to any books uh, that are sold uh, to East Bay Community Space, the space that we are in. This is a very uh, poly-friendly space and a very yes. queer-friendly space. It's a really terrific place. Uh, they have really been there for us as a community and we really want to keep them afloat. So uh, I would like, to, I will be donating any proceeds from the books tonight uh, to, to East Bay Community Space. And I want to encourage people to come out and come to events here. And if you're going to have an event, this is a great place to have an event, as you can see. So mm -hmm. consider having uh, your event here as well. I want to give a big shout out. Thank you from all of us perverts to East Bay Community Space. Yay! Thank you. Yay. We are very grateful to you. So. You know, that's a really great idea, and I just uh, want to mention that I also have a book which is only available as a PDF download, uh, but I would be happy to donate the proceeds of any of those that got uh, bought in the next, let's call it, three days uh, out of this. If you mention East Bay Community Space, I will do the same mm -hmm. and donate, because I also agree this is a wonderful space. I'm so happy to have it here. Uh, we came out for the uh, East Bay Poly Potluck and Discussion Group uh, a number of months ago, which normally would happen tomorrow, but there's something else going on uh, that I, uh, I'm not at liberty to talk about, and uh, I'm not sure I have found a place to hold it or somebody to hold it for me, so. But 
great space here. Thank you so much for doing it. I'm going to talk now about an exercise uh, that I call your jealousy pie chart. And the reason I developed this exercise is that people call me every day and they're extremely hysterical and they say, oh my God, I'm just so insanely jealous. And uh, I've discovered that just saying you're jealous doesn't actually tell you very much about what you're feeling. And it especially doesn't give you much of a clue as to what to do about it in order to feel better as soon as possible. Because when you say I'm jealous, it, o it only tells you a big uh, thing about jealousy being like this big bundle of different emotions. Anyone who's ever been in the grip of a jealousy experience can tell you that it's a full-fledged physical, mental, and emotional experience. It's a combination of a lot of physical sensations, everything from I can't sleep, my stomach hurts, I feel like throwing up, I'm sweating, I'm tense, I'm grinding my teeth, I'm clenching my jaw, I have headaches. It can be a lot of physical sensations. It can also be a lot of mental experiences, lots of racing thoughts, intrusive thoughts that you just cannot get out of your head, images you're seeing in your head that are very frightening and distressing and even can be like repulsive, uh, thinking about your partner being with someone else. Uh, and it's an, um, uh, an emotional experience as well. A lot of different emotions, but most negative and painful emotions fall into three categories, fear, anger, and sadness. And when you are in a jealousy episode, and it's pretty intense, that fear, anger, and jealousy can very quickly ramp up into terror, rage, and despair. And so with the jealousy pie chart, you're trying to imagine your jealousy as a pie chart. I'm going to use this little prop here. Uh, if you can imagine that your jealousy is a big circle, a big pie, and I'm sure you've seen these pie charts in newspaper articles and in books and textbooks and all. Your jealousy is a big pie and imagine 100% of your jealousy and try to imagine what percent of that jealousy is fear-based, physical sensations, thoughts, and emotions, how much of your jealousy is anger-based, physical, mental, and emotional experiences, and how much is based in sadness, in physical feeling, sensations, uh, emotional feelings, and, and mental images. And you're trying to come up with what is the percentage of each one that makes up your jealousy, and then figure out what's the biggest piece. As you can see from this pie chart, you, I have fear, anger, and sadness. It could be 50% fear. It could be 20% anger. It could be 30% sadness. It could be any different percentage of any one. And you may be surprised to find out what percentage is the biggest. I usually suggest figure out which is the biggest and go after that first because that's the one that's the most debilitating. And this exercise, if you, if you actually would like to follow along with this at home. Uh, this exercise is, is in uh, the Jealousy Workbook, and it's on page 43, and it's about a 10-page exercise. It generally will take you an hour to two hours to really do this exercise really right or do it completely. But if you're having an attack of jealousy, you actually can do do it in about 10 minutes just to get the most basics and really get some benefit from it. So, if you discover that the biggest part of your jealousy is fear, and that can be any kinds of anxieties or fears that may come up for you, and they, it can be agitation, it can be any number of anxiety or fear-based feelings, thoughts, and uh, physical experiences, then think about what is it that you are afraid of? It doesn't really help that much to just say, oh God, I'm terrified. If you can figure out what you're afraid of, you can then figure out what you need to do about those fears. And uh, for most people, if fear is the biggest emotion, and for many people it is, uh, 
it's important to figure out all the different things you're afraid of. Usually it's more than one thing. Oftentimes the first thing that comes to mind is I'm frightened my partner's going to leave me. I feel very jealous and my jealousy is all about fear that I'm going to lose my partner because they're attracted to someone else or they're involved in a relationship with someone else or they're out with someone else right now uh, or they're considering going out with someone else. Uh, and oftentimes that's the first fear that comes to mind. But the reality is it's much more likely that what you're really frightened of is the scarcity of potentially losing part of your partner's time and attention to someone else. You're frightened of not getting enough, not getting enough love, not getting enough romance, not getting enough sex, or just not getting enough of your partner's time, fear of being lonely, uh, fear of just a lot of worrying about what's going on with your partner, fear about their level of commitment towards you. So if you can think about those different fears you have, you're able to then figure out what you might need to do in order to feel better. For instance, if your fear is about scarcity, then you can talk with your partner about asking them for a little more time and attention just so you feel a little more secure. If you're frightened about their level of commitment, you may need to talk with them about that in order to get some reassurance about how committed they are to you or how much they uh, are willing to acknowledge what their level of commitment is. Oftentimes, people are also frightened of their own inadequacies. We're often fearful, frightened that somehow we won't measure up to this other person or to how our partner feels about this other person. And those are fears that our partner can't really fix for us. If we have our own insecurities and our own uh, insecurities and feelings of inadequacy, that's something we need to work on ourselves to try to feel better about ourselves and to recognize what our positive qualities are. Uh, so that you're not constantly comparing yourself to someone else and worrying that you somehow are not uh, as beautiful or smart or sexy or charming or vivacious or interesting as they are. Uh, sometimes there is another fear that people don't often recognize, which is what I call public relations issues. Oftentimes people are much more frightened about uh, being in some way publicly humiliated by this situation. Well, what if our friends find out that my partner is sleeping with someone else? They're going to think that I'm a doormat, or they're going to think that my partner doesn't love me, or they're going to think we're breaking up or something. Uh, or what if our uh, family members found out? How would they feel about us? So sometimes it's not so much about what is actually happening, but your fears about other people's judgments of you or other people's judgments of your partner uh, if other people would find out. So if fear is the biggest aspect of your jealousy, these are the kinds of things that you want to be thinking about. What are you afraid of and how can you manage those fears? If in fact anger is the biggest part of your jealousy, then it's important to try to think about who are you angry at or what are you angry about. And uh, as with fear, often you're angry about more than one thing. Oftentimes, if you really break it down, you'll discover that you're angry at your partner because you feel somehow abandoned by them or you feel somehow mistreated by them because they're having a relationship with someone else or because they're attracted to someone else. You somehow feel angry at them because they're not 100% uh, feeling that you're the only person in the whole wide world they could ever be attracted to. That can make you get angry at your partner, whether it's rational or not. A lot, we often do get angry for that reason. Uh, it's also possible you may feel angry at your partner's other partner or somehow feel that they are hurting you and feel angry at them for the fact that they're taking some of your partner's time and attention away from you. You also may discover you're angry at yourself. Oftentimes people in this situation find there's a lot of anger that they're turning inward. Either uh, rationally or not, we often will blame ourselves for the fact that our partner is out with someone else and somehow feel inadequate or feel that there's something wrong with us because our partner is dating someone else, which 
again, it's not rational, but we often feel have those feelings. And if you do, it, it's good to just acknowledge them, that there's some anger that you're feeling towards yourself, even if it's not really warranted. Sometimes you just find you're angry at the situation, that you're angry about the fact that you are having to do some personal growth and stretch yourself emotionally to handle a situation that you may really not have chosen or that you may not really be that thrilled about. Or you may just be under a lot of stress right now and feel angry that you're being asked to cope with something else on top of work and kids and whatever other stresses that you're handling. And last but definitely not least, if you discover that in your jealousy pie chart, the jealousy is much more sadness-based, then it's important to look at that situation and see, well, what is it that I'm so sad about? Is it a feeling, am I feeling depressed? Am I feeling a sense of helplessness? Am I feeling like this is overwhelming and I just can't cope? What are the feelings that I'm actually having? Uh, and are those situations and feelings, are they based on the current day? Are they, are they based on what you're going through right now? Because often a situation where you feel jealous will trigger feelings of sadness and helplessness, hopelessness, powerlessness, all these feelings that may be from the past. You may be being triggered because this situation may feel in some way reminiscent to a past relationship where a partner hurt you or a partner where a partner may have broken up with you or a partner may have mistreated you or where you were in a very unhappy relationship. It may even make you feel in some way that it feels similar to a childhood trauma or a childhood situation where you felt sad and unloved or felt like you weren't getting enough attention from your family or parents particularly. So try to separate whatever you're feeling now from something that may be coming from the past and try to focus on what are the feelings that you're having right now. So as I mentioned, the jealousy pie chart is uh, something that if you really do it thoroughly, it can take you an hour to two hours. But if you tr are in a situation where you need help right away, uh, it can actually be useful if you just read through it, uh, read through the exercise, and then try to figure out what part of your jealousy is fear, what part is anger, and what part is sadness. And then go after the first, the biggest chunk first, because that will give you the most immediate relief. We're going to talk now about jealousy, coveting, and envy. And the reason I think it's important to differentiate between these three is because uh, coveting and envy are often mistaken for jealousy. And because the three things have different solutions, it's important to identify what the actual problem is. I often see people who are experiencing coveting or envy trying to solve a jealousy problem and thinking it's the same thing. So it's not just a semantical difference. There really are very different experiences. And uh, my esteemed colleague, Don Davidson, uh, has come up with three excellent definitions that are really useful. And because she came up with these brilliant definitions, I have, uh, with her permission, uh, stolen them and have used them in my books because they're much better than any definition I could come up with. Uh, and I'm going to re repeat those very briefly to you and then we'll talk about each one in a little more detail. Jealousy is, boiled down to its essence, jealousy is, I forgot something and I'm afraid of losing it. It's all mine and you can't have any. And it's about having something that you are very much, that's very precious to you and that you very much don't want to lose. Usually it's about having a precious relationship with your beloved partner and you are frightened of sharing that person, their time, their attention, their love with anyone else. So jealousy is, it's all mine and you can't have any. Uh, coveting is a completely different experience. In fact, it's almost the opposite. Coveting is, I have nothing, but someone else has something I want, and I believe that the only way to get it is to steal it from them. And so coveting is, you have something, I want it, I'm going to try my best 
to steal it from you. Usually it means someone else has a relationship that you want, that person. You have a, a desire to have a relationship with their partner, so you decide to steal that partner away from them because you believe that's the only way that you're going to be happy is to steal that person away and have that person all to yourself. The third thing is envy. And envy is very different. Envy is, I see that you have something that I admire and that I want, so I'm going to ask you to share with me what you have, or I'm going to go out into the world and find something similar that will make me happy. So you can see that the big difference between envy and, between envy and jealousy and coveting is jealousy and coveting both assume a scarce resource whereas envy assumes there's plenty for everyone. So with jealousy, you're assuming I have something and if I share any of it with someone else, I will not have enough and I'll be deprived. With coveting, you feel someone else has something and the only way that you can be happy is to take that away from them. It assumes there's not enough of that resource to go around and that it's both jealousy and coveting are kind of a zero-sum game. They both assume there's not enough in the world for everyone to get what they want, so I just have to either hoard what I got or I got to steal something from someone else to get it. Uh, envy, on the other hand, assumes that whatever is available in the world, that you're going to be able to get some of what you want and you're going to be able to be happy rather than feeling like you have to steal it from someone else or feeling like you have to hold on to and hoard whatever you have. Uh, a while back when I was explaining this to one of my clients, she said, oh, I get it totally. It's the parable of the peanut butter sandwich. And I said, well, I don't know what you mean by that. And she said, well, her five-year-old son had two of his pals over one afternoon and they were watching a video and her son said, Mom, could you make me a peanut butter sandwich? So she did. Five minutes later, she heard yelling and crashing around. She went in there, and it turned out her son says, Mom, he stole my peanut butter sandwich. One of the other kids had stolen the sandwich. And the kid said, well, I asked him if he would give me half, but he wouldn't, so I had to take some. I was just trying to get half of the sandwich, and so I had to steal it. And then, so there's... Jealousy, you've got a peanut butter sandwich, you don't want to share it. There's coveting, you want a peanut butter sandwich, you got to steal it. But then the third kid piped up and said, would you make me a peanut butter sandwich? So the third kid was smart enough to realize there's more than one peanut butter sandwich out there in the world. And in fact, I bet there's some peanut butter and bread right in the kitchen and I can get another sandwich. I don't have to steal it from the other kid. So that in, its, that in a nutshell is jealousy, coveting, and envy. And the key is if you are feeling jealous or if you're feeling coveting, see if you can shift your experience to envy. See if you can imagine that whatever it is you want, that there's more of that resource in the world and that you will be able to actually get what you need. For instance, I often see uh, a married couple and one of the people in the couple has an outside relationship. Let's just assume for the sake of argument it's a heterosexual couple and that the husband has another girlfriend. Often that the wife in that situation is very much feeling jealous, wanting to hoard the husband's love and attention, not wanting to share it with anyone else. At the same time, the girlfriend is feeling covetous, wanting to steal the husband away because she's not getting enough of his time and attention. If I can get all three of those people in a room together, I can try to help them realize the wife is actually only really envying what the girlfriend has, and the girlfriend is actually envying what the wife has. Because often when they really sit down and talk about it, the wife says, well, I feel resentful that he goes out and has these fun dates with her. They go out dancing. They go out for dinner. He buys her flowers. I'm, I'm very resentful because I'm not getting any of that. I'm at home with the laundry and the kids and the dirty diapers. Uh, and the girlfriend is saying, well, I'm so angry and so 
jealous that he's got this wife at home and she gets to live with him and be married to him and own a home with him and have kids with him and I'm just this other woman on the side. I feel really angry about that. When I'm able to help them understand that each one is envying what the other one wants and then they're able to say, well, then what can we do about it? Often for the wife, the solution is she wants some of that romance too. She wants the husband to give her some special attention. She wants date nights where they get a babysitter and go out dancing. And in fact, often the girlfriend is really looking for a real committed relationship and that partner is not really available for that. So often her solution is to go out and find another partner that really is fully available for a committed relationship and she can continue to have a relationship with this other with this man as well but at least then she's going to have her needs met for having a committed full-time relationship and she can still continue having a wonderful love affair with this person on the side and then in that situation everybody is getting what they need We're going to talk now about something that's called compersion. And for any of those of you who are not familiar with the concept, it's just a made up word. It was made up, uh, invented by the Kuristan communes in the mid 1970s. The Kuristan communes were there, there were a group of hippies essentially uh, in the 1970s who lived in several houses in San Francisco uh, and they believed in so-called free love and open relationships and all those things that were the way we used to talk about it in those days uh, and uh, they c coined the term compersion to mean something that is sort of like the opposite of jealousy when you're jealous you're feeling very possessive you don't want to share your partner with anyone the concept of compersion is something like the opposite of that where you actually want to share your partner with other partners where you actually feel happy for them and feel very uh, comfortable with them having other partners but that you actually feel happy for them because they are enjoying love romance and sex uh, with other people and for most people who are in open relationships that concept and that experience is a little bit remote. Most people are not really able to get there. Uh, for most of us, uh, we're lucky to get to what I call neutral. We're lucky to get to the point where we are feeling relatively neutral about the fact that our partner is interested in or involved with other partners. And I think it's an, kind of an unrealistic goal for most people to actually feel just thrilled <laughs> that your partner is out having uh, relationships with other people. Uh, and personally, I think compersion is way overrated. There are lots of people in polyamorous and open relationships who talk about compersion like it's the holy grail and like it's the thing we should be striving for. Uh, personally, I think it's way overrated for two reasons. First of all, my attitude is I am giving my partners the green light to go out and have sex, romance, and love with anybody and everybody uh, anytime for any reason. Isn't that enough? <laughs> Aren't I doing freaking enough giving them the freedom to do all that? Uh, on top of that, uh, I'm supposed to feel just giddy and thrilled when they are out on dates with other people or I should be like eagerly excited for them to have other relationships with other people. It's really asking kind of a lot and I'm not alone in feeling that way. Uh, most people that I know that are in polyamorous relationships have enough trouble just giving their partner that level of freedom that on top of that it's very difficult for them to actually feel really excited and happy about it. Uh, so for one thing it seems very unrealistic to expect but for another uh, 
feelings and behavior are two different things. It's one thing to ask someone to behave a certain way. It's another thing to ask them to feel a certain way. Uh, most of us do not particularly like other people telling us how we're supposed to feel. Uh, and most of us don't have total control over how we feel. Uh, we do have a lot more control over our behavior. And I feel like if I'm walking the walk by actually giving my partner that freedom, it's not really fair to ask me to feel a certain way about whatever they're doing. I get to feel however I feel, and I don't really feel it's fair for someone to tell me to feel a different way. And most people find they feel very resentful if their partner is expecting them to have a certain set of feelings for any reason. And the reality is my job as a polyamorous partner is only to be willing to give my partner a certain amount of freedom and to not to interfere or be obstructionist, not pr preventing them from doing so and not throwing a lot of obstacles in the road to keep them from doing so. Uh, there are some people that really do experience a lot of compersion, and my experience is that it doesn't happen just by accident, that the key to it is removing three important obstacles that will prevent compersion. The three things that will always prevent compersion are feeling of experience of scarcity, feeling mistreated, or feeling disempowered. And so if you are trying to move towards feeling some compersion, the most important things you can do is try to remove those three obstacles. The first obstacle of scarcity is the most obvious one and is actually the easiest one to fix or to change. Uh, if you are experiencing scarcity in your relationship, you are not likely to feel generous towards your partner having other relationships. If you're not getting enough time or attention from your partner, if you're not getting enough sex or romance from your partner, you're not going to feel very good about sharing that resource, that all of those things, time, attention, love, sex, re uh, uh, affection, attention, any of those things, uh, romance, you're not going to feel like sharing any of that with someone else if you're not getting enough of it yourself. So uh, if you need to negotiate with your partner, you may have to really talk with them to try to see if they're able to give you more of the resources you need in your relationship. Then you're going to feel a lot more comfortable about them going outside of the relationship and sharing their time with someone else and having sex and romance with someone else. The second obstacle is usually a little more difficult, the feeling mistreated. If you're feeling like your partner is really dismissive of your feelings, if you feel like they don't care about your needs or that no matter what you try to tell them, they're not really very responsive, then that's a situation where you're going to feel mistreated and you really need, may need couples counseling or some other help in order to get your partner to understand what your needs are. You may also need to figure out whether your expectations of your partner and of your relationship are realistic. Oftentimes when people feel mistreated, they, it's for a good reason and their partner is not behaving well, not either canceling dates on them or, you know, not being willing to accommodate their schedule or not being willing to give them the reassurance that they need, that they're loved and cared about. But sometimes it's that you may have unrealistic expectations of what your partner is supposed to do for you or what you feel entitled to in terms of what your relationship is like. So sometimes couples counseling can help with that as well if in fact you have some unreasonable or unrealistic uh, feelings of entitlement or expectation about what a relationship is supposed to provide for you. The third obstacle is feeling disempowered and that particularly comes, uh, comes to the forefront when you feel your partner is breaking agreements with you. You make certain agreements and guidelines in your relationship and they are not uh, willing to uh, go to really keep those agreements. They keep breaking them or they keep demanding changes in the agreements 
or no matter what you ask for, they feel like they have a right to do whatever they want without taking your needs into account, where you don't feel like an equal partner in the relationship. That sometimes when a, when a person has outside relationships, they start creating a power imbalance within the relationship and that partner who has another relationship often can exploit the fact that they can get more power in that situation by the fact that they may have two partners and you have one. So those power imbalances really can create obstacles to any kind of feelings of compersion. However, if you're able to address each of those three options, oftentimes you're able to just naturally start feeling more of a sense of compersion, more feeling happy for your partner that they are able to have another relationship and that they are, that you're able to give them that freedom without feeling resentful or feeling angry. And sometimes feelings of compersion will kind of sneak up on you when you least expect it. And oftentimes there you'll feel a mixture of both jealousy and compersion. For some people, that's the most baffling and confusing experience where on the one hand, for instance, one of my clients was telling me uh, that he was really thrilled to see that his girlfriend had attracted a really smart, really attractive, really great guy into her life. And he thought, wow, that really says something about me that my partner is able to attract such a great person into their life. At the same time, he felt very jealous and very threatened, feeling like, well, if this guy's so great, maybe she's going to dump me for him. So both of those feelings were happening at the same time, and that can be extremely confusing. Oftentimes, that's when someone calls me for some counseling, because they're trying to figure out, why am I feeling both of these things at the same time? Is one wrong and the other right? Or are they... The reality is they can easily both coexist, and sometimes the jealousy will get the upper hand, and other times Sometimes the compersion will get the upper hand. So uh, it's you. Sometimes you just have to go on the roller coaster with that and see if you can get to feeling a little more compersion and a little less jealousy. Um, I, we're going to move on, and I'm going to talk about uh, just briefly about the. Uh, about tips for the holidays, being poly in the holidays. There are a lot of uh, major poly debacles that occur over the holidays, and I'm sure some of you have experienced uh, that yourself. Um, I have a, a sh an article, and there's copies of it in the back. I didn't make enough copies for everyone because it's on my website if you want to read it. It's a nine-page article, so I didn't think any everybody would really want it, but there are a bunch of copies in the back if, if anyone wants them. Uh, the first uh, t holiday tip for poly people is, it's kind of too late for it right now because it is that your best bet is to start early in the season. Uh, I tell people uh, uh, the day after Halloween when you are stealing those chocolate bars from your child's uh, Halloween bag, that's when you should start thinking about the holidays. Uh, we're talking Thanksgiving, solstice, uh, Hanukkah, Christmas, New Year's Eve, New Year's, all those big holidays. Uh, and you should be thinking about it in the beginning of November and start thinking first about what do you actually want? What would actually make you happy over the holidays? Oftentimes as poly people, we're so busy trying to make everyone else happy that we forget to start with, well, what do we actually want to do for any and all of these holidays? Uh, secondly, have a conversation with each of your partners uh, well before the holidays, a, a private conversation with each person, strictly for information gathering, asking them which holidays are important, more important to them than others, what is the meaning of each of these holidays, if anything, for them, uh, and if they had to forfeit one or more of these holidays, which one would it be? Uh, when I say that, it's important to talk to them about the meaning of each holiday, because there's often a kind of a minefield uh, and you'll step on some landmines in discovering that holidays often have meanings that you're not aware of and it's important to find out what that meaning is. Particularly what would be the meaning of you not actually being available for a particular holiday is probably much more important than what the meaning of you actually showing up for it is. And 
Uh, once you know what you want and you know what your partners want and hopefully you've consulted your family to find out whether they've you know, bought tickets for a cruise, for, for the Caribbean cruise for the holidays and you're supposed to be there, uh, so know what's going on and then you can make some decisions about what you're going to do and trying to consult your partners to see if you can find enough overlap that everyone can be happy. Uh, there, it's important also to understand whether your partners are considering any of these holidays a test. I always tell people don't make any of the holidays a test because if you do, your partner is going to fail that test. If you decide a month ahead of time, if he can't be here with me for Christmas, that means he doesn't love me. Uh, you know, if you decide that that's a test, you're going to cause that person to fail that test. If it's really important for you, for that person to be with you on Christmas, do tell them that and try to work. Another important <laughs> uh, tip that I often give to people is, if you are thinking that it's a brilliant idea to get all your partners and their partners together for Thanksgiving or solstice or Christmas or something, before you think too much about that, ask your partners how they feel about that and think for yourself about how it's actually going to turn out. Uh, so I'm, I'm doing a literal face palm here because okay. there was an experience that I had um, at the point where my uh, now ex had uh, recently gotten involved with the woman he's still involved with and he decided that it would be a great idea to in, invite not only her, but also my other partner and my other partner's family to an event where he was going to cook for all of those people and my parents. Mm -hmm. Wow, that was a bad idea. So yeah, that's definitely one check in first. Um, and uh, one other thing before we go back to your regularly scheduled Kathy uh, <laughs> is um, if an event is not important to you, really consider uh, making that known. Uh, same partner, uh, we had a, a horrible experience right at the end of things uh, of my involvement because it turned out that he thought that she needed to be at Thanksgiving at my house and she didn't actually care about Thanksgiving at all. And I was pretty upset at the notion that he would force someone that I was having a problem with to be with me when she didn't even care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> absolutely, I absolutely would agree with that. Uh, an even worse idea that some people have had and uh, is coming out to your family about being poly at oh. Christmas or Thanksgiving or some other holiday uh, with your family and your partners. It's it really not a good idea. I can just, if I had more time, I'd tell you why, but you, you may already know. It seems like a good idea when you think about it, but it really isn't. So, but if you decide to include your various partners and uh, metamors and all that, uh, if it, even if it's okay with everyone, I would urge you to keep it short because <laughs> sitting through like an eight hour Christmas day with people that maybe you have some issues with or maybe one of them has some issues with each other, it's just a long time and can be pretty uncomfortable. So best to keep it short if you, if you can. Last but not least, if, uh, if a holiday polydrama does ensue or something goes wrong, be the first to apologize and really try to make it right, even if it really wasn't your fault or even if very little of it was your fault. A lot of things happen over the holidays that are completely out of your control, like somebody forgetting to thaw out the turkey and so dinner's four hours late and therefore you missed, the, you had to miss the other event you were supposed to go to afterward. Or your partner cut their thumb on the new mandolin slicer and we had to go to the hospital. Yeah. Oh, yeah, these things happen. So uh, 
uh, it's much better to take more than your share of the responsibility than less because regardless of whether it was your fault or not, you still have a very hurt, angry partner who missed out on a holiday with you and they're upset even though it's not your fault. So it's best if you can apologize and try to find some way to compensate for that. So, so I just want to make that very brief, but there is a handout in the back if you do want to read even more about that. And, and I, you know, oh. I think that's a really good piece of advice in general and um, really related to the whole jealousy thing is as much as possible, own your stuff. You know, it's gonna really help to reduce feelings of jealousy if you're not also feeling like your partner has their head up their butt, you know? If they're able to own their part of it and you can own your part of it, then you have a lot better chance of both compersion and a reduction in jealousy. I wanted to mention one more thing. You have one other handout uh, in your packet and it's just called What to Do If Your Partner Is Jealous. And because everyone is here tonight, I'm kind of assuming that you yourselves have a little bit of an issue with jealousy, but oftentimes you're also going to be dealing with a partner who's extremely jealous. And we're not going to go over this because we don't have time. It was just kind of a little bonus uh, freebie. Uh, I definitely encourage the person who, if, if you are a very jealous person, to read this over so that you can explain to your partner what they can do to help you in that situation when you're jealous. If you're the partner that doesn't tend to be jealous and you're the partner where your jealous partner is screaming at you, uh, this can be helpful. This can be very helpful to try to remember that you know your partner's in an altered state right now and they really need your love and support. Even if they are overreacting, even if they're behaving badly, they don't need you judging them and criticizing and telling them to just calm down uh, because that's really only going to make things worse. Uh, there's a, a kind of a mismatch that happens when you're, you know, you're jealous, you're upset, you're having a lot of feelings, but your partner is in a mode of logic and arguing. And so you got the one person, the jealous person, me, saying, ah, feelings, feelings, and then you're saying logic, rational argument, and you're not hearing each other. I always have to tell people, you know, that's for later. Like, bring that up tomorrow or the next day or next week when the person mm -hmm. is really in a more rational state. That's the time to say, you know, when you called me a selfish little bitch the other day, <laughs> that really wasn't okay and you need to apologize. That's the time to say something like that, you know, is a few days later when they're calm and rational and they'll be ready to apologize. Uh, it's not that you should accept any kind of abusive behavior, it's just that at that moment the person is really not able to have a conversation with you. So I just and want people to Related to that, to that uh, if you are the one who's feeling like your partner is insane with jealousy, you will need some support too. Do not try to get it from your jealous partner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we're gonna go to just questions and uh, people, if you have some jealousy scenarios you want to tell us, and please use the microphone, we'll just pass it back. This gentleman has a question, pass it back to him. Um, and we, because uh, we only have about 15 more minutes, and then I think they are gonna throw us out of here. <laughs> no, I'm not the clay crazy. Um, so, as you were just talking about you know, in the moment uh, when the jealousy in the partner arises, um, what would you recommend is the best course of action for the partner who is? doing their utmost best to be as understanding as possible in that moment. What do you have advice for the person who feels that anxiety welling up and wanting to knee-jerk react to it, and then the person and pe or people that are dealing with that at the moment? Yeah, I actually have a short list of tools for the non-jealous partner. And it starts with realize that it's not about you. Quit taking it personally, even though they're telling you that it's about you. It really isn't about you. It's about their stuff internally. Also, things like, you know, take the long view. 
because if you can realize that if you give something now, give them a little space, give them time to recover, you will probably reap great benefits uh, over the, the long view. Uh, and um, one of the things that I really like is write down all the reasons that you love your partner and post them somewhere that you can review them when they're off in their jealous fit. That's, uh, you know, sometimes it's really good to remind each other why it is we love each other, which brings me to another tool that I absolutely love in this case, which is the appreciations exercise, where uh, it's a structured version of giving each other appreciations and telling them specifically uh, what they've done or specific qualities of why you love that person. Because as you're telling each other these things, you do this, you know, three, three different things and then three different things you tell each other. As you're doing that, you will remember why you loved your partner. You know, even though right now you're going nuts because they're insane with jealousy. But if you, t if you remind yourself it will help you to be able to work through that. One thing you'll notice on that sheet is that the first step is uh, shut up and listen. That you really <laughs> yeah. have to listen and give your partner time to say the things that are on their mind. And then the second step is to try to see if they are rational enough to be able to tell you, do they want a change in behavior or a change in agreements that you have or do they just need emotional support? Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes that's a big mismatch too, because the person is saying, oh, I'm so upset, it was really hard for me because you stayed overnight with that person for the first time. And so your, your thought is, well, okay, do you want me to never stay overnight with them again? But usually it's just, they want you to acknowledge that that was hard for me and I really did something that was hard for me and I did it because I care about you and I wanted to give you this freedom and that they need some acknowledgement of that and, and, and for you to give them a little support. That Sometimes often... they do want a change in behavior and you, that you're trying to ask them to be clear about that if there's something they want you to change about the situation. That can often be one of those gendered uh, items because it's often the case that men are socialized to step in and try to fix it immediately and the women just want to uh, hear that uh, you know uh, the, the acknowledgement uh, and the validation now of course this is not a you know uh, biological thing again it's a socialization thing that we experience Start over because I couldn't hear you. I have a partner that he helps me with my jealousy. I think um, I, he lets me go crazy, mm -hmm. and then we talk about it afterwards. And I realize that I'm really passive aggressive, and I, I sabotage it. And he doesn't let me sabotage it and run away. He mm -hmm. he lets me. He wants to talk about it, and be like he'll wait a day. Let's talk about it. Uh -huh. And Dawn, I mean, I almost broke down on Thanksgiving, and she answered her phone, and I was first my first panic and um, yep. of jealousy. And she knows I didn't think she was going to answer the phone. Um, if it's not for my partner helping me through these things, I don't think I would be recognizing it. I would be going in another relationship again and again not dealing with these jealousy uh, uh, things. And I think he's really helped me with talking about it. And then I can apologize, like, hey, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that was totally wrong. I said that and that mm -hmm. was, I didn't mean that, you know? And, and it's the self, it's the sabotaging, I think, that I would like to, mm -hmm. to with that jealousy part. It's not sabotage it. I don't want to sabotage it and push him away because of my, my, um, my fear of losing him. Uh -huh. Yeah, a lot of these things also point back to doing your own self-work, you know, that the more you can uh, realize that actually you are all that, you know, you're a pretty cool person and of course they'd want to be with you. So you don't need to feel jealous because they're off with somebody else because that other person is also a cool person, but differently than you and you are that great and of course they're going to come back. Questions? Oh, pass the microphone over to 
Hey, I, I was just wondering if uh, you had a tip for something that I could do every day to uh, just as a practice to erode those uh, three barriers to compersion. Just like a little something. If the, is there something you could do every day? Yeah, just, just something every day. I don't just know, stop. You know? to, I mean, uh, one gratitudes. Of the, yeah. Gratitudes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Write down at least three things that you are grateful for in the world every single day. The more grateful I am, the less jealous I am, the less I feel uh, competition or inadequacy. Uh, one, uh, one thing that's helpful to me, that person because of that, and we're, we're kind of ingrained in thinking, well, if that person's better, why wouldn't they leave me? But that's just not how people operate in life. It's just what we think they're going to do. Otherwise, my partners would have left me a long time ago. <laughs> because, you know, they date people that are way better looking than I am and a whole lot smarter and, you know, really just a whole lot nicer in general. <laughs> more available, have, they have more free time than I do. And, you know, so they would have left me decades ago if, if, if that was how it worked. So. But uh, one last, one more uh, thing on that. On, in order to generate compersion for me, I have to really make sure that there's no scarcity. Because for me, you know, I, I grew up with a real scarcity of everything in my life, uh, and especially scarcity of love and attention. And so I'm just terrified of, of that scarcity. So I just have to make sure that if I have enough of my partner's time and attention, then it doesn't matter who else they're involved with because I'm getting my core needs met. And so that is really key for me. And, and each person probably has their own thing that it's like, okay, this is the core thing I absolutely need to feel safe and secure. If you can figure out what that is for you, you probably can develop compersion. Yeah, also remember that we are polyamorous, right? Uh, and uh, this means that I can get my needs for attention met with other partners as well. Um, Don, your comment about uh, the long view reminded me of something I would wanted to say, uh, and this is one of those things I think is a lot easier said than done. Um, when I really try to think deeply about it, I think a lot of jealousy is rooted in a sense of possessiveness and ownership mentality and attachment. My definition of jealousy is when someone else wants to take something that I've got and you know when that happens, when when I see my partner, you know, putting their attention elsewhere, there's immediately that welling up of of loss. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Really? The fear, the sadness, the anger, all of those things. And again, much easier said than done. But what I try to tell myself is that I don't own my partner's right. love and attention. They're giving it to me freely of choice. And if they choose to take it elsewhere, that's their choice. Uh, and it's not mine to have and lose. It's theirs to give me or not. And if they want to give it elsewhere, I have to let them. Yep. <coughs> totally. Did you have a question? Actually, my question and comment was an appreciation of what you've expressed. I want to say thank you for expressing something vulnerable. And if you're willing, could you actually um, give specific example of how your partner holds you when you are being sort of passive aggressive and being irrational? How, when you guys? Yes. On the mic. Please tell us how to do that. <laughs> we need that information. I, I, well, maybe Dawn should. Dawn's the one that has helped me through this. Um, it, it, it's actually, it, I, I I make a list to myself what Dawn has given me skills, what she just said. He's not, he's not leaving me. And so what he knows what I need is that reassurance, is that because I have this sense of loss. And so he reassures me, like, I'm, where do you think I'm going to leave you? Did I say I was going to leave you? But automatically our head thinks. Our head plays mind games on us that they're going to leave us, and he loves that person more. And, He's never even said any of those things. So he tries to tell me the op you know, everything that I'm thinking, 
no, I love you. I'm not going to leave you. This is going to be better. I'm going to have more love. Like, all the positive. Like, write the positive and write the pros and cons. And there's only one con there, and that's just the sense of loss that I need to figure out myself. You know? I need to figure it out. Um, and that's where he, he's just helped me. Like, Don knows him. He's so talkative. I and mean, he's just one of those caring individuals that just is trying to, he loves me, so he's trying to do whatever he can to help this relationship and nurture it. And all it's done since this has started, since what, October? I know, I called you Thanksgiving. All this has done yep. <laughs> is made our relationship stronger. I mean, I am so happy in love with him. It's completely crazy. I mean, everybody's like, whoa, you're, you have this smile on your face. And all it's done is made us closer. Mm -hmm. It's just made this strong, incredible bond between us. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I, I would add one thing to that. Uh, I often have people uh, in my office who are hysterical in the middle of a you know major jealousy attack, and they'll say, "Oh, but this is going to happen, and these they're going to leave me, or they're going to do this, or they're going to love them more." And I I sometimes say, "Would you bet a thousand dollars right now that that's going to happen?" And they'll say, no, I wouldn't. I said, well, would you bet $1,000 that that's not going to happen? And usually they say, well, yeah, probably, or at least 500 <laughs> Because the smart money is on, no, he's not leaving you. And he's you not know? leaving me. And, and he, I went into a, a, a not a good relationship for 16 years, not married. And he would say we're spiritually married. And I said, we could spiritually get divorced. And that's what I did. And... Through those 16 years, he never asked for therapy, he never went to therapy, and he's paid for therapy, and he wants to go to therapy, and he wants to keep on trying. I mean, it's just, I've never been with anybody that's like him, that right. just encourages me to be a better person. Right. And I see these flaws, and for the first time, I want to change these flaws. Not for him, but for me, because I realize these flaws... I don't like. I don't like to be jealous. I don't want to be insecure. I want to be, I want to love myself. Mm -hmm. And he's making me realize that you need to love yourself. I can't bring that. You know? mm -hmm. So I, it's slowly been a process. Yeah, I think that's, that's great. a really great thing in relationship is that ability to learn to love mm -hmm. ourselves. And it's an indication of a good relationship when we feel good about ourselves in relationship. It's also one of the warning signs uh, that a relationship is maybe not the right one or no longer the right one, is if all of a sudden all we are is our worst selves. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, that was definitely a, a bad moment for me, was realizing that I just was bringing the worst of myself to my partner. And maybe it was time to change that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have to wrap things up, and uh, oh, we've got one more question. We'll take one more question, then we're going to have to wrap things up, because I do want to close down here. Microphone? Could you have the microphone? Uh, uh, hi. I was wondering, how do you deal with the other side of the sense of loss? Because you're talking about, okay, this person's not going to leave me, uh, but I feel like there's the other side of, you know, what happens if they do, or like... Yeah, just you know, being able to work through those scenarios in your head, and I, I understand the uh, like there's more fish in the sea argument, but what are the other tools there? I'm not, I'm not quite clear what the other you side are of saying. Loss and well, I'm not sure. I understand. Well, there's like um, the uh, you know the the sense of loss of somebody, and then there's there's the side of like oh okay they're gonna stay, but then there's also the side of like what happens when they do leave. Or what if it's a a real Threat. Yes, exactly. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Uh, uh, my recommendation at that point would be to uh, probably get some help from somebody out, outside of your relationship uh, to deal with whatever the underlying uh, issues are in that uh, because it's really hard when the relationship actually is. Uh, in danger and it could happen you know it definitely I was known for being uh, very compersive and not jealous until the moment that the relationship was actually threatened and all of a sudden it was like whoa there it is 
and uh, going and getting some help would be one of the things I'd say. Kathy, do you Couple, have anything some else? Couples counseling. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> From a great yeah. couples counseling. Well, and it's, it's also that uh, it sounds like in, in this situation there's, there is a real possibility of the relationship not surviving. Is that the kind of situation you're talking about? And then it, it is really important to get couples counseling to see, well, is this relationship a viable relationship? Is there some other reason that it's not working that has nothing to do with the polyamory situation. I often see people who are in a kind of unhealthy or unhappy relationship suddenly deciding, well, let's try to open up our relationship and see if that'll help Relationship us. broken, add and, more people. And that is really, uh, uh, usually a disaster. I mean, that relationship was usually going to end anyway, and then adding another person kind of speeds up the process usually. So yeah. better to just, before you even go there, get some couples counseling and try to figure out if you're really compatible. Uh, it's, and then some people even do a worse thing, which is deliberately are looking for a replacement while not breaking up with their partner. Ugh. They're looking for a replacement, so they say, gee, let's have an open relationship. I've got a crush on this person. Yeah. So that's really a recipe for disaster, too. Better to uh, try to figure out whether your relationship is compatible enough to really have a future together before thinking about uh, having some kind of open relationship. So I actually have a whole uh, handout on this that you can get off from my website. Um, it's called Is It Over? And you can find it on the free stuff tab. And my website is uh, www.loveoutsidethebox.com. And one of the things that uh, it says is if the relationship is going to end, then we could look at it as a loss, as a failure, uh, which is the usual societal model, or we could look at it as a graduation, that it's time for us to move on to whatever's next. So that's one of the things you can do if it does end. Easier said than done, John. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, we're going to have to quit. Uh, I'm, I'm certainly going to hang around a little bit until they throw me out the door here, and so I'm happy to answer questions individually until that time comes. Thank you all. Thank you very much.